Welcome, everybody. Thanks for uh, checking out this talk. It is an overview of Drupal front end component integration methods. A uh, couple of housekeeping e things. There's the bit.ly link there, bit.ly slash component dash int. That's going to take you to a little sandbox repo that has the examples I worked up for this talk and uh, also links to the slides and also past versions of this talk. And uh, also, um, you know, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat, um, but mostly we'll loop back for questions at the end. If you want to just tag your um, comment in the chat as a question, uh, that'll help me track it down. But otherwise, uh, have fun in the chat. So let's uh, let's get going here. All right, I'm uh, Brian Perry. I'm a lead front end developer at a company called Bounteous. Uh, I live in the Chicago suburbs. And I'm a lover of all things component and component based, which obviously is very relevant to what we're going to be talking about today. Um, building and theming with uh, components in Drupal, design systems, and uh, tools like Pattern Lab and Storybook, and increasingly building with component based JavaScript frameworks like React. And uh, also a lover of all things Nintendo. Uh, so love to talk about what you guys are playing on your, your Switches. For me, it's uh, Animal Crossing, uh, New Horizons. And I'm very excited for the Paper Mario game coming out this Friday. Yeah, Nintendo FTW. <laughs> uh, and then I'm uh, available on the internet in a variety of places and would love to internet with you. So as I mentioned, I uh, work for a company called Bounteous. Uh, back when uh, everybody was going into offices, uh, we have a number of offices throughout uh, North America. I mean, we still do. Uh, and uh, I was based out of one of our Chicago offices. Um, Drupal is one of a handful of things that we do at Bounteous, but I predominantly work in the Drupal practice uh, with a bunch of other great Drupal folks. And I learn so much from everybody on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, if you're looking to do great Drupal work, we're often hiring. And if you're looking to have great Drupal work done, I can certainly get you in touch with somebody. And then did want to take a quick moment to kind of acknowledge the uh, the ride we've been on lately and uh, this interesting year and uh, this happening remotely. Um, just to say that it's been uh, really meaningful to me to be part of the Drupal community during this time and have ways to contribute back to the project. Um, and uh, it's also great to be part of uh, you know a community that takes uh, diversity and inclusion seriously and is looking to improve ourselves there and also acknowledging the mistakes that we've made along the way. So looking forward to be able to do uh, this sort of thing in person again in the future, but also happy that we have uh, what we have now. So um, we're gonna talk about uh, components obviously and specifically ways to uh, pass data into them and integrate into them. But I just wanted to really quickly up top talk about uh, component-based development just at a, at a high level. I'm not gonna spend too much time selling this concept. I've uh, spent entire talks on that in the past. But um, so component-based development is the idea of building with uh, modular and reusable elements. So building a system rather than a series of pages. So if a developer hands off a, a, a Photoshop mockup of a page, uh, first off, maybe you should have a conversation with them about that. But um, rather than building just that instance of that page, it's breaking it down into its component parts so they can be reusable and they can be used to make that template and other templates and that instance of that page. And uh, it often uh, uses a pattern library tool for documentation and so things like Pattern Lab and Storybook, but um, those tools aren't required to take this approach. You can still break things down into their component parts without using a tool like that. Um, and this approach can also help uh, decouple back end and uh, front end development in some interesting ways. Um, so you can build these components in isolation uh, before the functionality exists in Drupal. Uh, theming doesn't have to be tacked on at the end, good things like that. And uh, it's popularized by Brad Frost's atomic design uh, concept, which is really just one way to describe and talk about breaking things down into their pieces and combining them into larger elements. Um, but any way that uh, it works for you to talk about and think about that concept uh, is valid. So uh, today we're basically just going to look at one example uh, component in Twig uh, specifically um, a number of different times and look at all of the different ways that we can use it and pass data from Drupal into it. 
And I wasn't joking about uh, my affinity for Nintendo. So I took this opportunity. We're going to be looking at this container component on the right-hand side there. And uh, it uses the NES.CSS framework, which is a little uh, CSS library that allows you to create cool, old-school Nintendo pixelated-looking uh, styles. So the component itself um, has really just a, a handful of variables in it. There's the title and a couple of uh, tags, the platform and the year, an image, body text, and uh, a link. And then a quick look at the Twig template uh, for this component. Um, so we're, we're using uh, the classes from the NES.CSS, NES container with title, et cetera. Uh, we have some conditionals for the different uh, variables, so we're not going to render markup if the, there is no data passed into the field. Um, and then we have like a wrapping div for the badges that we see there, and also obviously the variables themselves, platform, year, image, and so on. Oh, thank you, Christina, for posting the uh, link to the repo. I should have done that. Um, OK, so this is uh, a YAML file that has data for this component. Um, and uh, so this example that I built is using Pattern Lab, uh, but other tools have similar concepts. So it's really just representative data that you can use to render an example of the component. So you know, we see we have things like some, some strings, markup, and so on. And then one other little piece of the puzzle here is we're going to take our container components and we're going to render them in a, in a grid, a three up grid here. Um, nothing uh, all that complicated going on in the CSS for this. It's just a grid class that uses CSS grid at different responsive breakpoints. So uh, now let's talk about, uh, now that we've seen uh, this example component and what it looks like outside of the context of Drupal, let's talk about uh, components in Drupal. And there's a few different kind of uh, dividing lines I'm going to use along the way here. Uh, the first one is where your components live. And from the perspective of this talk, uh, I'm going to divide it into what I'm calling a standard Drupal component and an integrated Drupal component. And really, the difference, from my perspective, is a standard Drupal component lives in Drupal's default templates directory, uh, either in a theme or a module. And because of this, it's not going to require much or potentially even any effort to get data to display in it. It's kind of where Drupal expects to find it. And then an integrated Drupal component lives anywhere other than that default templates directory. Uh, and as a result of that, it might require, is likely going to require some additional effort to get data to display in it. And for this talk, it doesn't really matter how those integrated components get into your theme. It could be just a subdirectory in your theme. That's what I did here, just for the sake of simplicity. It could be a completely external dependency. But the general concept of getting data into it, a lot of those are going to be similar regardless of, of where it's coming from. So uh, standard Drupal components first. Um, and you know we're going to talk about some other kind of uh, more complicated approaches. Um, but doing what Drupal expects uh, could very well be right for you and your team and your project and, and potentially the you know, scale and complexity of your project. Um, so here, you're going to be building with Drupal and probably only Drupal in mind <clears throat> and taking advantage of things that can be uh, easily reused in Drupal. So things like display modes and blocks. And people often use paragraphs as a way to represent a component. Uh, layouts uh, in Drupal, another potential uh, thing that can be reused as well. You will lose out on some of the rapid prototyping advantages we talked about by not using um, a, a tool like, uh, like a pattern lab or a storybook or having um, Basically, the issue here is that you're going to have to stand something up in Drupal to see what it looks like. So let's look at our component uh, from the perspective of a standard Drupal component. In this case, the, uh, the, the thing that we're using is a, a view mode, the teaser view mode in this case. And we have a game content type. So the game content type has a label that represents the title. And then a handful of fields that really kind of map one-to-one -to, -one to the things that are in this component, year, platform, image, body, so on. 
So uh, here we have a template suggestion for no game teaser, which is uh, just copied from the uh, default node template in the classy theme in, in our custom NES theme. And then in the classes array, we're adding some of the uh, classes that we need from NES.CSS so that things uh, render all Nintendo and pixelated. And then the rest of the stuff that you see is from the default uh, node template. And if we look uh, a little bit lower here, um, we're really just uh, kind of reworking the markup and bending the markup to the needs of our component in this case. So um, you'll see that we have uh, like a wrapping div for the badges with the NES badge and is splitted class. Um, and then we're also kind of uh, explicitly rendering out the fields where we need them. And then the grid layout, we're just creating a view for this um, called games. And this is a uh, unformatted, unformatted view template. Um, and really we're doing very little here aside from wrapping uh, the markup that this provides by default with our grid class in order to get it into our three upgrade. So uh, that was kind of following Drupal's lead and uh, doing Drupal's default there. Now we're going to take a look at integrated Drupal components in a handful of different ways that we can deal with components that live outside of Drupal's uh, traditional templates directory. <coughs> Excuse me. So as I mentioned, in this example, um, uh, I have a, a pattern library, and it lives in my custom theme in the NES components subdirectory. And uh, I'm using Pattern Lab with it. So uh, it kind of follows Pattern Lab's default structure. Uh, there's a patterns subdirectory with a components directory inside of it, and then in there, a container subdirectory. And that has all of the things that we need to render this component, which in this case is uh, just a twig template and the YAML file that has data. And we can see in Pattern Lab what it would look like with this example data, examples of markup, all that good stuff. So now if we're starting to think about how we can use it in Drupal and get Drupal's data into it, the first thing that we're going to need is the components module. So this module uh, allows you to create twig namespaces. Um, and let's Drupal discover templates that live somewhere else than the templates directory. Because um, that's where it would, the only place where it would discover templates by default. So in our info.yaml file here, um, we have a component library section and we defined a, a component namespace uh, that points to that components directory that we saw. I'll be saying the word components frequently. And then now that Drupal can find that template, um, the next kind of fork in the road is how we're going to uh, provide the data to it. So the kind of two categories of integration approaches are mapping data in code versus mapping data in the admin UI. So mapping data in code is going to include uh, mapping data in Twig templates using preprocess or kind of potentially any um, you know backend code approach that's going to queue up your data. This approach is um, more likely, uh, from my experience, to get out of sync with the Drupal UI, so like not reflect what's in the Manage Display tab, for example. And then also, if you're not careful and strip out too many things, it, it can also be more likely to break things that Drupal depends on. Like uh, Quick Edit is a common example, um, or cause uh, issues with caching. Um, and then mapping data in the admin UI, on the other hand, uh, uses the uh, can use the UI patterns module, uh, Drupal layouts would be another way to do this. And uh, because it's a Drupal module and kind of going through uh, Drupal, it's less likely to disrupt Drupal functionality, but potentially not as flexible in that you know these modules have a particular feature set and follow certain conventions. So uh, integrating in code, um, all of the things here are, are the same. We're still using the teaser view mode. And our game uh, node has all the same fields. So the first approach that we're going to look at is mapping data in a twig template. And these examples are kind of intentionally quite simple. Um, but here we're using uh, what's often called a presenter template, a twig presenter template. So 
uh, in that same for that same template suggestion node game teaser that we saw before, um, we're including the container component from our component library and using our little namespace shortcut of components there. And then we're saying with and listing out all of the fields that are in our component templates and specifying what data that this uh, template has access to should go into that. So label for the title, um, URL, platform, year, et cetera. And then uh, alternatively, uh, this could be done in pre-process as well. Um, so this is a in our nes.theme file in our custom theme, uh, a pre process node hook for the game content type. Uh, this is probably the world's simplest pre process function. Um, all it's doing here is just taking the variables that are already available uh, to um, this node and mapping them to where they need to belong in the variables array so the component template can find them. Um, there's obviously a whole lot more that you could do here. Um, there could be you know, a bunch of logic in your preprocess. Uh, you could reference other things. Um, but this is just a really simple example of just taking, taking the data and putting it where it needs to be. And then back in the Twig template in Drupal's template directory, um, the presenter template, all we have to do is include the uh, container Twig template from our component library. We don't necessarily have to map out all of the individual fields because they're going to be available to that component template. Um, and especially from the perspective of uh, mapping in a Twig template, there's some helper modules that are going to prove very useful. Um, twig field value is one of them, which lets you get partial data from field render arrays. Um, so that field value uh, function is going to uh, allow you to get just the content and not uh, default wrapping divs, so you can map just the data that you're looking for. Um, you may also, though, need to be careful uh, and, and take additional caching considerations, especially if you're using something like that field target entity, um, so that Drupal knows when that uh, entity is being referenced and needs to be invalidated. And then Twig Tweak just uh, provides a bunch of helpful functions and filters. You can render views, blocks, regions, images with specific image styles. Um, so if there's something that you're trying to do in a Twig template that's proving difficult, um, definitely check Twig Tweak. There's also a handful of other similar modules uh, that may have already solved that problem for you. And then also kind of in the same neighborhood, there are a bunch of uh, starter kits and themes in, in the community. And this is really going to give you a great starting point for setup and provide default tooling for you if you don't want to build your front end workflow from scratch. Um, some of them have uh, components that they ship with. Um, and they're going to have you know, varying levels of how opinionated they are about their, their workflow and things like that. Uh, but the Emulsify theme uh, is quite popular for people that are new to this uh, component-based theming approach. Um, Gesso, uh, the Shyla theme, and Particle are all other great options. Um, and again, can give you a, a great starting point to take this approach. And because at the end of the day, uh, you know, they use a similar approach to component mapping, there's really not a whole lot to show here. But the one example that I did take a quick look at was using Emulsify in their most recent release, which is uh, Emulsify Design System. And uh, one thing that's interesting about uh, Emulsify Design System is it uses Storybook for HTML as opposed to Pattern Lab, which it's used in the past. So here, we're still using the same uh, presenter templates and the same component templates, but they just live in a different location per Emulsify and Storybooks conventions. And uh, you know, it's a different component library tool, uh, Storybook in this case. But we still see our components, um, all old school Nintendo looking with example data in it. Uh, how we actually define our story in this case, rather than pattern, is a little bit different. There's a JavaScript file, but, but still, conceptually, we're doing a lot of the same things. We're uh, specifying where the template is, um, importing any assets that we need, providing data from the YAML file to our component, and rendering out our example. Um, and then here's an example just in a, a sub theme of Emulsify. Um, 
where at the end of the day, we just see our same uh, container component. Um, the mapping process is, is still really similar here. So now uh, let's look at uh, some ways that we can map data in the admin UI. I see uh, definitely some good, good chatter in the chat, which is awesome. Um, so the first example that we'll look at is the UI patterns module. And the way that I like to describe UI patterns is uh, it lets you define in and manage components in a kind of Drupal-centric way, a way that Drupal better understands. Um, so UI patterns are Drupal plugins. And uh, when you've defined a pattern, you can configure the mapping in the admin UI. And uh, there's also an optional pattern library page that's just exposed in Drupal. It's kind of like a mini pattern lab. And you can also do things like pre-process your patterns, render them pro programmatically, and all uh, kinds of good stuff like that. So in this case, uh, the thing that we're using and reusing is a, a pattern, uh, the container pattern in this case. And the uh, variables are all the same variables that we have in our twig template. So to create a pattern, we need to create a pattern.yaml file um, in a pattern subdirectory in our theme in this case. And um, uh, you can have multiple patterns in a single YAML file, uh, but the convention I typically see is uh, a single pattern per file. Uh, then you have an ID for your pattern, a machine name, and then a label and a description. And then a lot of what you see here is defining the fields. So each field has a, a type, which is mainly used for documentation, label, description, and then preview content. So some of these are just strings. We also have markup. Um, there's a few other things that you can pass in there. And that's used in the example pattern uh, page. Now a little bit lower in the YAML file, there's some other cool tricks here. Uh, you can define libraries. So if there are certain assets that your pattern uh, depends on, uh, when you use this pattern, it'll be loaded. And you can also use the libraries defined here as dependencies of other libraries um, and other components. And then the use statement is really great in that it basically tells this pattern, you know, when you're loading this pattern, use the template here in our component library. You can even use twig namespaces there. And uh, it essentially uh, prevents you from having to actually create manually that uh, presenter template in the middle. It's doing something similar behind the scenes, but you don't actually have to like add it to your code base and maintain it. And then this is an example of the pattern library page, uh, which obviously looks a little bit crazy due to all the NES.CSS. Um, but uh, there's our container component that we've seen a handful of times, a table with all the fields. Um, and this kind of serves as a, a great kind of a piece of Drupal documentation of the things that are kind of Drupal admin ready, uh, components that are Drupal admin ready for you to provide data to. And then uh, there's a handful of integration modules, but we're just gonna look at one for the sake of example, UI patterns views in this case. So uh, with it enabled in your view, you can specify that you wanna show a pattern and in the row style options, uh, you can specify what pattern you want to use. And then you're able to map the fields in your view to the uh, variables in your pattern. So title goes title, body, body, and so on. And then as a result, for every row in your view, it'll be rendered using that pattern and our container template. I see some semantic debates in the chat. Fantastic. <laughs> um, so uh, another way that you could represent this is using uh, Drupal layout. So in this case, uh, the thing that we're reusing is a, uh, a layout, a container layout. And then layouts have regions. So the region, the data for the region is what we're passing to our component template. And uh, there's a handful of ways that you can find layouts. Uh, in this example, we're using a layouts.yaml file in our custom theme. And uh, so there's a machine name for the, the layout, label, category. The template obviously is pretty important. And um, that needs to live in your templates directory and have a uh, html.twig extension. And then uh, beyond that, you're defining the regions 
for your layout, which in this case, uh, you know, map to the fields that we've talked about over and over. And then in our uh, layout template, we're including our component template, as you might expect. And we're mapping the regions, content title, content platform, et cetera, to the slots in our component. Uh, if you want to use these layouts with Layout Builder, there are definitely some additional considerations you need to think about. So really what it comes down to is that you don't want to strip out uh, the things that the Layout Builder UI depends on. So um, you'll need to use the attributes object, um, have the wrapping markup that's expected here. So for example, there needs to be a, a wrapping div with the region attributes and the related class for each of your regions. Um, and this is so the drag and drop UI can pick up on it. Um, so the other thing that you have to think of kind of on the other side is if you're using a tool like Pattern Lab or Storybook, it needs to be able to understand these Drupal specific things like the attributes object and add class. Um, there are definitely, it's definitely a solved problem, um, but may not be something that, you know, is uh, shipped out of the box with your uh, pattern library. So then at the end of the day, when we add a section in Layout Builder, uh, we can pick our container layout. I didn't give it a fancy uh, uh, image, maybe should have. Um, but we see visually all of the different regions, um, and we can add blocks to them. You'll note here that the, um, the kind of uh, badges get a little crowded. Um, so depending on your component, it, it may not really make sense to represent them visually. It could be especially programmatic, problematic if there are things that um, don't need to be rendered visually um, that you need to represent and pass data to. That might be a situation where like uh, block configuration is the better approach. But so it'll vary a little bit depending on your component, whether or not this visual approach makes sense. Um, but it's cool that it's definitely another way that you could represent uh, your component. And uh, so now another kind of uh, split that we can talk about is uh, different component definition approaches. So pretty much everything that we've talked about falls under the category of manual definition. So we're defining our components in code uh, to some degree so that Drupal then knows about it. And uh, pretty much all of the examples that we saw are going to have some amount of duplication between Drupal and what you're representing in your component library. Um, like the YAML files that we saw for uh, the data for your pattern versus like things like um, the layout or a UI pattern, a lot of overlap there. Versus the kind of emerging or experimental concept of automatic discovery. Uh, in this approach, a Drupal module will discover components in your component library and automatically make them available to Drupal. And this is also going to require a kind of a particular convention. And as a result, won't work with all component libraries. Um, they'll certainly work with some. And uh, also, you might be able to kind of orient your approach around something that is friendly with uh, this automatic discovery. So we'll look at a, a few examples of that. Uh, the first is the UI Patterns Pattern Lab module, which is a module that I maintain. And this uh, will discover. Uh, patterns in a Pattern Lab instance and expose them in Drupal as UI patterns. So the end result is going to be the same as what um, we saw in our UI patterns example. Um, but you don't actually have to manually and explicitly create that patterns.yaml file. Potentially some limitations here. Um, you do need a YAML or JSON file that has uh, example pattern data. That's how it's going to know what fields are part of your, uh, your pattern. And uh, there's kind of, uh, it can be a little bit challenging and it requires a specific approach if you have like deeply nested components. And then also, uh, you know, since we talked about layouts as an alternative here, um, there's also the layouts from Pattern Lab module that, that I've created that's a very similar concept. This is very early. Um, maybe even in the, the category of failed experiment. But it's the same sort of idea deriving uh, from a pattern lab instance uh, layouts that are available in Drupal that you can use uh, with Layout Builder and other places that you can expose layouts. 
Um, similar to what UI Patterns offers, you can specify whether or not you want to render the default field wrappers or just content. Um, but as I mentioned, there are a handful of, of limitations here. Um, some bugs with the layout builder drag and drop. Um, but uh, you know, an interesting experiment in of itself, uh, if anyone wants to try it out or maybe even uh, you know, keep pushing it forward. And then uh, there's also the pattern kit module that falls into this category, which uh, thankfully is uh, not a module that I maintain. Uh, it's maintained by the folks at Red Hat. And this, from my perspective, kind of has aspects of manual definition and automatic discovery. Um, so you have to create a, or it depends on a schema definition file, a JSON schema file, um, which in and of itself has potentially some applications outside of Drupal. And it can automatically derive blocks from your pattern library components, supports a specific set of field types. Um, it's in active development for Drupal 8, but there's also a Drupal 7 version. And um, here's a quick example of uh, configuring and uh, having pattern kit discover your patterns. So in your libraries.yaml file, you can add a pattern section with a path to the location of your patterns. And here we're specifying that they're twig. And then this is an example uh, JSON file, JSON schema file, um, kind of similar in concept to a lot of the different ways that we saw of representing these components and patterns. Um, but you know, a lot of what you see here is representing the fields and you can specify the field type along potentially with some options like the body allows you to specify if it's a WYSIWYG field. And uh, you can also have settings that are specific to the uh, pattern as well. Uh, you know, if you want to change layout or styles for the overall component. So what you get at the end of the day is a block uh, type that you can use in the blocks UI. And uh, we have all the fields that we defined along with our settings. And it, again, is going to give us something that looks like our container component, unsurprisingly. So uh, kind of one last area that I want to talk about a little bit is uh, prepackaged component solutions. Um, these aren't really going to, in many cases, address kind of the integration challenge that we've been talking about, um, but I think are just an interesting option in general. So. Uh, one that's a real nice, fully fleshed out uh, design system is the Bolt design system. Uh, the folks at uh, Pegasystems uh, built this. And these are a set of ready to use web components, a complete design system of web components. I believe they can also render as Twig. And uh, another cool thing about this is you can selectively require the components that you want to use uh, in your build. And then there's also the Compony project with a uh, you know, great uh, five-star name there, um, which is, describes itself as a component distribu distribution system. Um, and it has a theme, a gulp workflow, and components that you can choose from. Um, and you can also create your own. Uh, at least last I looked at this, uh, it didn't really have a composer or NPM-driven workflow, uh, which means that it really doesn't fit into my workflow. But just in general, uh, it's interesting to, to look at another approach to having Drupal-friendly components uh, that can be easily distributed and shared. And then a couple of other things uh, that, um, uh, again, don't directly address the integration uh, problem necessarily, but there's the single file components module. Um, and this allows you to create a Drupal component with a kind of view single file type syntax. So we'll see here that there's uh, twig markup, CSS, there can be JavaScript logic in here, all in one single file. You can then use like any template. And you can automatically generate uh, libraries, derive blocks and layouts from them using annotations. Uh, it also does have a, a little component library page uh, that you can turn on. Um, and just, I think, is very interesting from like the perspective of distribution and reuse of components. And then one last one that was uh, brought to my attention quite recently is the uh, component, not components with an S, but component module, um, which was recently released. And it's uh, yet another way that a component can be defined in a, a YAML file. And uh, a block 
configuration can be derived from it. It seems to be more focused on the decoupled use case. I, I've only had a limited amount of time to play around with it. Um, and is inspired by the progressively decoupled blocks module, if uh, you've had an example to, uh, to use that. Um, but definitely something uh, worth checking out. But, but also just, uh, it is interesting, especially with a handful of these, that there are a lot of modules, a lot of approaches, a lot of people uh, solving a pretty similar problem as far as um, you know, repeatable, uh, distributable uh, components within Drupal. Which leads really nicely into um, some of the things that came up in the Dries note today. I, I was sneaky and took a screenshot. <laughs> and uh, so there was a lot of talk about uh, components in general, component-based theming, but especially the concept of uh, building a uh, you know, small slice uh, admin UI component, a menu component, um, that can be distributed and available in both React and Vue. Um, and this is pretty exciting, given all of the things that, uh, that we talked about. Um, it'll be really interesting to see where this goes, but also uh, I'm hoping that there are things that we can all learn and you know, standards that we can pick up as far as like a clear pattern that can be repeated for making Drupal-friendly things that can be easily distributed. So uh, kind of springing from that, last thing that I want to talk about is just kind of overall workflow what I currently do and uh, kind of where things may potentially be going in the future. So the honest answer for me is that uh, I find that I'm still leveraging kind of a mix of some of these approaches. Um, I do tend to use integrated components um, that live outside of the traditional templates directory. Sometimes that is a external dependency. Sometimes it's not, kind of depends on the project. Um, but most of the assets uh, live outside of the templates directory. Um, I'm still pushing to try to make the mapping something that can be done in the Drupal UI, but find that it's most successful for pretty lightweight components. And then for things that are a little bit more complicated, I, I find that I have been leaning in the direction of using preprocess for things with uh, heavy logic over mapping in Twig templates. And uh, Part of the reason for that is that our uh, backend developers have gotten really good at providing helper functions to make it easier to get data into our, our components. I've also created some uh, helper component preprocess classes um, that I've used that I'm hoping to also uh, contribute in the future. And uh, also, in general, just trying to build components that are uh, friendly to Layout Builder. So using custom block types and uh, pretty limited use of paragraphs at this point. And uh, a question that you might be asking, and I've uh, been asked for previous iterations of this talk, is so what should I do? A lot of great, great examples, but what should I do? And my general answer to that is I would start with the approach of mapping in code. That's definitely the uh, kind of most battle-tested approach. Uh, Folks have been doing it for a while. I've had success with it on projects. Um, and it, which of the mapping and code approach makes sense for you is going to kind of depend on your team makeup from my perspective. So if it's predominantly something that's handled by front end developers, they might be comfortable and get more success doing that in uh, mapping in the Twig template. Um, if your you're people responsible for this are more back end savvy, um, they might be more comfortable doing it in pre process. Um, End result is kind of the same. We're just getting the data where it, it needs to go. Um, so again, it kind of depends on your team. And then as you become comfortable with this approach and uh, find success with it, then uh, you might want to consider some of the, the more uh, advanced things that we talked about. And then as far as like kind of what my dream workflow for the future is, the honest answer is something like uh, what I'm uh, familiar with working on React projects or, you know, pick your favorite JavaScript framework here, um, where there's a, an ecosystem of uh, easily available distributed components that you can easily install, uh, easily important to your code, and use them as you see fit and pass data into them. Um, and that's uh, particularly interesting given you know, some of the things that we that were talked about in the Dries note and how we're looking to do that uh, with uh, React or Vue components. Um, but how do we get there? I do think that we have a lot of the different pieces that we need. And I, I know we haven't talked uh, too much about the decoupled uh, kind of view of this, but there are a lot of tools there too. 
but I feel like we're at the point where we need a little extra Drupal magic and, and certainly some kind of more focus in the standardization. So I do think that anything that can be done to make it easier to package and distribute components um, is going to be really helpful. Um, and I think the evolution of web components uh, might help here, especially you know if we're looking to create build uh, components that Drupal can use that are available in both React and Vue. Um, and I'd still like to see uh, improvements in the UI as far as how you can handle these mappings in Drupal's UI, rather than it being you know something that's predominantly done in code. And keeping it friendly for layout builder, I think, is important. And uh, I also, you know, it's probably appropriately prioritized on this list, but I still would like to uh, see approaches evolve as far as Drupal being able to automatically recognize and understand uh, components. But, um, you know, kind of one of the big things is that we just need to keep building amazing uh, and wonderful component-based sites in Drupal. And then also, you know, as I've, I've touched on, I think the some of the concepts for um, these admin UI components uh, is going to be a really interesting initiative and has a lot of overlap with the things that I've talked about and uh, I'm interested in. So I'm looking forward to seeing where that goes, what, you know, we can learn from it and hoping to find ways that uh, I can uh, contribute as well. And then last uh, kind of little uh, shout out hat tip here to more folks than I can possibly name, but I wanted to thank uh, all the folks in the Drupal component ecosystem who have, you know, shared their learnings and their code um, and helped me along the way. And uh, I'm really happy to be, you know, just a small part in this nice little friendly corner of the Drupal world. Um, so thanks everybody. And uh, yeah, looking forward to more. And uh, also um, would love feedback on this talk. Uh, there's the survey monkey link, which I think is also in the chat. I think there might also be a link on the session node. Um, and then also uh, at a couple of days uh, next week, um, also virtual, um, I'll be giving kind of a decoupled uh, focused version of this talk, if you're interested in, in that angle on this. And uh, I think we have a little bit of time, tiny little bit of time for questions. Um, and also feel free to, to track me down uh, elsewhere through the conference or on Slack or whatever. Happy to keep talking about this stuff. Uh, okay, so dig some questions here. I'll probably just have to go backwards. Um, can we get your slides was the first one that I saw pop up. Um, Yes, they are. Uh, there's that Bitly link uh, that is earlier in the chat. I'll also tweet them up, tweet them out, tweet them up. Apparently, is a thing I invented. Um, and the the repository has them. So I think it's like bit.ly/component-int. Also, drop it, drop it in there. Um, what are your thoughts on having a component-based theme? And also Drupal modules with design and presentation elements built in. How do you go about connecting design and interactivity from these modules into Storybook or Pattern Lab? Do they need to be recreated from scratch in Pattern Lab or Storybook? Um, that's a good question. Uh, hard to answer succinctly. Um, but really what I, I focus and I think others uh, kind of recommend there is it, that there potentially needs to be a distinction between uh, Drupal and the components in your component library in that they shouldn't necessarily have Drupal specific things in them. And if you do that, it makes it easier for you to uh, integrate them into Drupal and into you know, potentially other CMSs as well. So if you find yourself doing a lot of very Drupal specific things in your components in a separate component library, um, you're probably making it harder for you to be able to reuse them potentially. Hopefully that helped. Uh, let's see what else. Scrolling back, scrolling back. Thanks for all the thanks and positive uh, words. Definitely good chat back here. A lot of requests for my slides. Appreciate that. If anybody has a question that I'm not seeing that they really want to make sure I catch, feel free to drop it in again. A comment on uh, security coverage for these modules, which is a very valid point. Um, let's see. Yep, there's a good question from Kevin earlier about uh, handling 
um, cache tags and other metadata. And Mario had a good answer there. They can be achieved by ensuring you're passing the full content array versus only the field values. I think there was some good chat about pattern lab versus storybook. Um, question, is it fair to say emulsify is saying goodbye to pattern lab? Yep, that does seem to be the case. Cool, I'm sure I missed some. Oh, here's one from uh, Mario. What is your default method for integrating components? Um, yeah, my default method for integrating components really at the end of the day probably still is uh, mapping in code and uh, doing a lot of the, the heavy work in pre-process. Um, yep, yeah, presenter templates, but um, Mario, I would say that by doing more of it in uh, uh, pre-process, there's a lot less that actually ha has to happen in the presenter template. The presenter template itself is pretty lightweight. Uh, yep, and then uh, mention about the security coverage concerning modules that I've been presenting. Uh, again, that is a valid point and something that I probably should go out of my way to, to mention. Um, there are uh, various levels of coverage or lack of coverage, and as is the case with other things in the Drupal ecosystem, um, you need to uh, you know, consider the risk there and, uh, and look at the modules and, and see if they're things that you're comfortable using. And also, you know, it would be good for us to try to push to get security coverage on some of these modules. All right, I think I am uh, up on time. I appreciate all the great uh, chat and questions and uh, feel free to um, follow up if you have any questions. There was one last question, is it necessary to create a, for every view mode per content type, a template to integrate with the component? Uh, no, it is not. There's lots of ways that you could um, we use that. For example, if you're including a component template, you could include the same one in different view modes. Cool. All right, I'm going to wrap up because I'm over time. Um, but thanks, everybody. This is great. And uh, DrupalCon Global has been awesome so far. I look forward to participating more in the next couple of days. Bye.